Well, folks, welcome once again to another episode of the Images in Focus show. I'm Juan Pons, and with me, as always, is my good friend, David Swindler. How are you doing, David? I'm doing great. How are you doing, Juan? I'm, I'm doing great and kind of getting excited now that we're in winter because winter is one of my favorite times of year uh, to shoot. As a matter of fact, is when I'm most active photography-wise. And on this episode, we're going to be talking about winter photography. David and I have both been shooting in winter conditions for you know many, many years. And during that time, we have gained you know a wealth of knowledge and information and tips that we are going to share with you. We're going to be talking about gear, techniques, and you know what's so special about uh, winter photography. So why don't you get it started, David? Absolutely. So just a quick outline of what we're going to talk about. First, we're going to touch on what is so great about winter photography. That's a good question because it's cold outside. Uh, the weather is often unsettled. Why would you want to get out and shoot? We're going to talk about what makes it so good for landscapes and also what makes it so good for wildlife. After we're done talking about that, we're going to discuss staying warm because let's face it, if you aren't staying warm, you're not going to take very good photos. And we're going to talk about the importance of layering, uh, how to keep your hands and your feet warm, how to protect yourself from the wind and much more. And then we're going to go into some very specific cold and snow issues that we deal with as photographers and how we can get around those. We'll talk about some specific shooting techniques as well at the end of the presentation so that you know how to maximize your shots when you're out in the field. So let's jump into winter landscapes. The thing I love about winter is that the days are short. You know, I don't have to get up at four o'clock in the morning to go shoot that sunrise like I do in the summertime. And I can usually be back at a respectable time for dinner after sunset. The other great thing is that the angles of the sun are much lower, allowing you much longer times to shoot with great light throughout the day. Uh, the snow and the ice can add wonderful accents to your shots and add a lot of simplicity to your landscapes. And you also get many more chances for moody and unsettled weather. Sometimes during the spring or the fall, especially like in the Southwest, we get just long periods where you just get nothing but blue skies. But in the wintertime, that's rarely the case because you often have a lot more storm fronts kind of moving in and out. And then winter is much quieter than many other seasons. And it's the perfect time to escape those crowds at the more crowded locations. And then you have many opportunities in the wintertime to create these unique in eye-catching shots. You can ca capture those conditions that hardly anyone else will see. And if you're far enough north, you can also get chances to photograph the aurora borealis. And you have things like fog, frost, icicles. Uh, think macro uh, shots of snowflakes and so forth. So you got so many things that you can shoot uh, beyond just the, the landscape that's in front of you. So this was the first snow we had of the season in Bryce Canyon. It didn't snow a whole lot, but it snowed just enough to really give some nice accents to this landscape. Now Bryce Canyon can be, sometimes be difficult to shoot because there is usually just so much orange everywhere. But when you get the snow, look what happens. The snow breaks up all those orange and it allows you to see the groupings of the hoodoos. And that gives it so much more three dimensionality. Here's an example from Iceland. Uh, normally, this is a black sand beach, but we had some crazy cool conditions one winter where there's a thin sheen of water that formed over the top and it froze in, into a sheet of ice. And then we had these cracks where the black sand was kind of pushing out of the ice sheets. So not only did we have these neat cracks in our foreground, but we got great reflections of the mountains and the clouds on the ice. So once again, this is the kind of shot that you would never be able to get unless you're willing to go out and shoot in the winter months. I love the Aurora Borealis. Uh, this shot on the left here, you know, standing on some very thick ice, uh, we lit up the ice with some external lights. Um, this was in Canada. The shot over here was up in Alaska. Uh, one thing I will tell you, though, is when, in the wintertime, you can't be lackadaisical when it comes to your gear. You know, I was out here shooting for quite a while at night and, you know, I eventually just walked away from my camera thinking not much of it. And of course, right when I walked away, a big wind gust came and it blew my camera over and oh. it ruined the lens that I had on my camera. So 
this is the last shot kind of that I took before the camera that was taking the shot got blown over by the wind. So and that's a hard sure fall too on that ice. <laughs> oh, it is. Yeah. It was a, it was probably like a $400 repair. So not fun. Uh, the other thing I love about wintertime is that with the presence of snow, it reflects so much light and it really livens up your foregrounds when you're shooting at night. And so even in the middle of the night here, you know, there's so much light just reflecting off the snow in this scene that, you know, I don't have to resort to trying to light up an entire landscape with external lights. And then you get these neat conditions like uh, this uh, formation up in Canada. Normally you can't get down under here because it's a raging river underneath. But in the wintertime, this all freezes up and there's still some flowing water nearby. And that flowing water creates this mist that will like coat these rocks here in this like hoarfrost. Uh, Juan and I are getting really excited for our upcoming Yellowstone workshop. And up in Yellowstone, it gets so cold, especially with these thermal features that we have. And you get a lot of fog and mist that forms. You know, on one of the sunrises we had, we had this really cool cold mist and fog just coming off the ridge lines and accenting that moon as it was uh, setting uh, back behind the hills. Or when we're out near the thermal features, then we get really neat fog and light uh, in uh, displays that happen that really add a lot of interest and moodiness to the photography. Yeah, that was in uh, Norris Geyser Basin, and that was uh, really, really unique conditions we encountered when we were there. It was really exciting to see these sort of shadows being cast with the light that was being behind it. It was really, really eerie, but so cool at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. And then you know, the other thing I like about winter is when you do start getting that snow, it doesn't matter anymore that the trees don't have leaves as long as they're flocked with snow. And this is a case here with this shot in Zion National Park. You know, I saw that it was going to be snowing quite a bit that morning, so I did this long hike out there and got very wet in the process you know, with mm. all the snow falling off the trees on me and everything else. But I can tell you it was 100% worth the effort. And then, of course, you got all these options. You know, when you have icicles hanging down, you can use those for foregrounds. Uh, sometimes I'll even get my macro lens out and just shoot details of ice crystals. There is so much to shoot in the wintertime. Now let's move on to wildlife. Uh, with wildlife, they are more active in the winter. The animals still have to eat even when it's cold outside, and they often have to keep moving to stay warm. They are also more visible because the snow really kind of simplifies the landscape and allows you to see the animals better unless they have white fur. Then it can be a little bit more difficult. Uh, the animals also have thicker and more vibrant coats. So they look a lot more regal, a lot more polished. Uh, it allows you to create unique images. And then the thing that Juan and I both really like about winter wildlife is that the presence of the snow acts as a giant reflector. So it really helps to soften harsh shadows and it adds more light into your scene. So even when it gets like late into the day, when, you know, in the summertime, it might be too dark to try to shoot wildlife. But in the wintertime, you're still getting so much light reflecting off that snow that you can continue to shoot, even with faster shutter speeds. And then the snow really adds a great degree of simplicity. You know, it takes, all, it takes away all that messiness that you may otherwise have. And so I'm going to turn it over to Juan now to kind of go over some of his wildlife examples from winter conditions. So, yeah, that was, that was great. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some of the pictures, you know, winter wildlife and um, kind of match them a little bit to some of the points that uh, David just went through, because there's a lot of stuff in there, a lot of good stuff. And, you know, I cannot stress enough what David said about the snow acting as a reflector and we'll see that in in, in a few minutes here so let's uh take a quick look at some of these um winter images and this is actually an image that i worked on for many many years to try to get um this image let me actually just uh, show the image here in its entirety um and you know this is a fox that's kind of curled up in the snow with a little bit of ice uh a snow falling on it but still looking over at us keeping an eye on us and what I love about this image is the simplicity, something you would never be able to get in any other 
time of the year because the snow removes all of that messiness of the, of the foreground, removes all that vegetation, and really makes the, um, the fur and the color of this animal sort of shine through. And what's really cool about this, you know, one of the other points that uh, David brought up is, you know, the fox, the color on the fox and the thickness and luxuriousness of the coat is definitely uh, much more pronounced in the winter. You know, their coats have to be on in, in tip-top shape to be able to uh, survive winter cold conditions. So during the winter, their coats, these, these animals look almost... I want to say almost twice their size. If you see the same fox, for example, in the summer, they may look pretty thin and scraggly, but then you look at that same fox in the winter, um, and they are they just look almost like twice their size because it's that much more plump and with a lot more um, thick fur and colorful fur. Another one here that um, that it's also again simplicity. Uh, this is probably one of my most well-known images from Yellowstone and definitely one of my favorites for a number of reasons. Um, it, you know, this procession of bison coming in towards us. And this is something that, you know, would be hard to get in any other time of the year also because what's happening here is that this these bison are actually walking on the road towards us. In a lot of other times of the year, the bison wouldn't necessarily be traveling on the road. They'd be traveling out through the grasses because they're, you know, opportunistic. They're eating as they're walking along. But in the winter, when the snow could be three, four feet deep out in the prairie or out in the in the valleys, you know, these guys will take advantage of the roads to move from one location, from one feeding location to another. And we take advantage of that and very safely are able to get out of our vehicles and make images like this of our bison coming in straight towards, especially when you have beautiful falling snow and a much more simplistic background that brings out those subjects out from the background. If you had, um, you know, your normal browns and darks of that background in your scene, these bison wouldn't pop out as much into the scene. Uh, let's look at another image here. This is uh, a bobcat in the snow. And again, this is another situation where... Um, during other times of the year, these guys are very well camouflaged to their environment. And this is, you know, they rely on that to be able to, uh, to catch their prey. But for us as photographers, sometimes that can be, you know, we can use that to our advantage, but oftentimes it can be challenging because we cannot see the subjects well enough. Whereas when they are completely um, uh, separated from the background because of the snow, we, you know, our attention is drawn straight towards our subject and we can actually see, you know, everything about the subject, its behavior, its intensity, it's coming in to catch a muskrat out of the water. So this is another image that we could only capture during the winter. Um, this is a coyote howling with Lamar Valley in the background. And if you did this any other time of the year, yeah, you would get some separation between the background and your subject, but you wouldn't get that separation between those amazing cottonwoods that we have in Lamar Valley and the rest of the valley, which completely makes this image. Again, being able to separate those subjects and also the fact that if you look at this image, that we have this back, this light coming in, this not the backlight, but a uh, fill light coming in from the bottom, and we can see the entire the entirety of our coyote. Where this shot at any other time of the year, where you know, you, you know there's a, a grass or, or dirt underneath our subject, we would have a much stronger light coming in from above, and we'd have much sharper and uh, oftentimes too strong shadows on the underside of our subject. So we wouldn't be able to create as pleasant an image as, as something like this. Here's another one, a favorite of mine from many years ago. Um, this is a family of, of river otters um, with the adult in the back and the two um, uh, pups in the front. I think they're called pups, right, for, uh, for river otters, or are they called kits? I think they're pups. Um, pups yeah. I think they're pups. And again, this is another situation where being able to have a much more simplistic environment, a much more simplistic uh, background still telling a story about the environment that our subjects are in but makes these guys really stand out and um, show 
uh, show themselves and be able to look at all the detail in our subjects without getting distracted. But at the same time, winter can show us a little bit of um, the camouflage of some of the other critters that exist out there. This is a long-tailed weasel, which is one of probably the most elusive and hardest animals for us to photograph when we're out in Yellowstone, just because they move so incredibly fast and because, as you can see, they're almost like ghosts against the snow. Uh, what really helps here is these willow branches that uh, are setting up kind of an environment for our, um, uh, for our long-tailed weasel. These guys are usually brown in the summer, but in the winter they turn white in order to sneak up on their prey and avoid predators. And so this is an opportunity that we're able to see in winter that we cannot see any other time of the year. But the, the landscape is also that much more dramatic in the winter as well. You know, the way that we have this contrast between the snow and the green of these evergreens and the contrast between the rock of those mountains in the background and the snow and on the, the evergreens on the background, as well as with the um, atmosphere, the clouds that are coming in, complete this image to make it that much more um, ethereal looking and kind of mystical looking. At the same time, it allows our bison to stand out and become a focal point of our image, you know, in a way that it wouldn't necessarily do so in the rest of the year. And the, the last one that I want to show you is also providing a little bit of a feeling of harshness of the winter, um, which is to me part of the story, right? The, the fact that these animals have to um, struggle or they have to fight to, uh, uh, to survive in the harshness of the winter, be it cold, but also the depth of the snow and uh, in the places like Yellowstone, like this, the, you know, sometimes these animals get covered in frost overnight because you have all these, all this fog from the thermal, uh, thermal uh, features coming down and settling on them, and in the morning, you, you know, they get completely covered in frost. Sometimes, you know, the the cover could be an inch or so thick, um, and it's something that they have to overcome. So yeah, I mean, I hope that these images are helping you guys understand what, why for us. Winter is such a special time and environment um, to photograph in. So what's next up, David? So one, the next thing that's really important is how do we stay warm when we're outdoors? And oftentimes as photographers, it means that we're just standing around maybe in one spot for an hour or maybe even longer. <laughs> and so it's, at least for me, it's really hard to stay warm if I'm not that's, active and yeah. moving. So what are some of your techniques on how you stay warm in the outdoors? Well, I mean, certainly, you know, there's a couple of things you have to make sure that you do. You know, the big thing is that uh, you want to dress in layers, you know, and we've heard this, you know, from our mothers when we were little, right? We've heard this over and over again, you want to dress in layers. And there's a really, really important reason why you want to dress in layers. And it's because there is such a thing as being overdressed in winter, right? People don't think oh, about that. Oh, it's really easy. <laughs> But it's really easy to be overdressed. And what happens is if you get overdressed, you end up sweating under your clothes. And if you end up getting wet under your clothes, guess what happens when the temperature drops again and you're no longer overdressed? All that moisture that's underneath you gets cold and starts sapping heat from your body. And that can actually, you know, depending on where you are, that could even be dangerous. Um, so being able to have layers, use layers, is super, super important. It's critical, not just to stay comfortable, because like you said, you know, we want to be out there, we want to have fun, right? And, you know, it's, it's, we don't want to be miserable out there when we're shooting. Um, we don't want to be too cold, we don't want to be too hot, and we need to have layers to be able to remove those layers as it gets warmer during the day. So for example, um, in Yellowstone, it is not unusual for us when we're out shooting uh, sunrise, for us to be, you know, for the temperatures to be like minus 10, minus 15. And for that, we will have a bunch of different layers. I'll have a base layer, then I'll have usually another layer over that, then I'll have a sweat, uh, uh, something like this, kind of a thick fleece. And then over that, I'll have my jacket, usually four layers for that kind of, for that kind of temperature. But then as the day goes on, middle of the day, we may see temperatures in the 30s. 
So it went from minus 15 to 30. If I kept all those layers on, and then we went, you know, walking. I'm not even going to say hiking or snowshoeing. We just walked a half a mile. You know, during that period of time, with all those layers, you would start sweating and you would get wet. Um, and that's definitely something you don't want to do. So layers is super, super important. Now, the other thing is, right, you want to keep, you know, so, so we talked about layers kind of in your body, but you also want to keep your head nice and warm. Um, super important to keep your head nice and warm. Usually I have, you know, something like, you know, a big fluffy um, ja- uh, he- uh, headgear that I wear, and I wear this no other time because it's not very flattering on us, right? You kind of look like somebody from uh, Northern Exposure. Um, But it's super important to stay nice and warm. You know, usually wear something like a neck gaiter of some kind um, as well to keep my neck nice and warm and kind of seal off um, the parts of the face that may not be covered by my headgear. But, you know, for a lot of people, keeping your hands warm is super important, especially when we're out shooting. My technique, and I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are on your technique also, David, but my technique is to wear a nice, um, warm, but not too thick pair of uh, glove liners. And these are fleece, which is my favorite. Um, And I wear these all the time, all day long, pretty much. And most of the time, I'm okay with this. If my hands get a little cold, I'm able to put them in my jacket pocket. And in my jacket pocket, I'll have one of those chemical warmers, hand warmers, to warm my hands up if they get a little cold. Now... Um, the cool thing is, you know, if you can try to get some of these, I have the little finger tip on them. So you can use your, the back of your camera, you can use your, your smartphone if you need to. But I also bring with me a nice pair of heavy duty mittens. Um, and these are the ones from heat three. And the cool thing about these is that, um, I can put these on, keep myself really warm, but if I need to shoot with them, I can open the zipper, bend them back. And then I have full use of my fingers as well. I don't necessarily use these very often um, because my hands get kind of really hot in these. But when I need them, when it gets super cold, these are a lifesaver. But you could buy, you could use a regular mitten if you wanted to and then take your hand off when you need to use it. Or the other thing to use is um, a mitten um, shell. They sell these, a number of different companies sell these, which is basically like a, like a Gore-Tex shell that you can put your hand in and it keeps it nice and warm when you have a... Uh, a liner like this one. So what, what's your technique to keep for keeping your hands warm? Yes, I use very similar. I like to use like a very thick glove liner. And I also make sure that they're touchscreen compatible. Like this particular one is actually waterproof. So it's nice, you know, when I'm going to be shooting in snowy or wet conditions. And then I'll have a thicker pair of mittens like this. And one thing I like is to have the leashes that go around mm-hmm. my wrist. That way it's really easy for me just to pull my hand out my mitten isn't going to fall or get lost. And then as soon as I'm ready, I can just stick my hand with my liner back in the mitten. The other thing that I like to look for is a lot of these mittens, they'll have like a little pocket where you can open that up and put in like a hand warmer or something like that. Or you can just have a hand warmer in the mitten, the main compartment of the mitten itself. Yeah, they're really cold. Absolutely. Now, you you know, your hands, you have a problem where your hands get cold quickly, right? Yes. They're my hands and my feet are the wussiest part. Right. (laughs) And that's why, you know, you have a thicker liner. Because my hands usually are, you know, they do fine. So that's why I like having the thinner liner because I feel like I'm, I'm able to use the camera a lot more effectively with a thinner liner. But I, you know, my hands can tolerate more of the cold. Uh, whereas my feet, on the other hand, my feet get colder than your feet. So for my feet, it's a whole different story. You know, for my feet, uh, I use kind of, again, the layer system. I have a uh, thin uh, sock liner, which is basically a thin sock that you use. And mine are made from um, merino wool, which really adds a nice layer of um, uh, to your feet. And also, because it's wool, it... Uh, wicks away any moisture that you have and it doesn't it separates any moisture from your feet so that if there's any moisture any sweating that's going on in my feet you know it gets 
off of the merino wool liner and it goes onto the thicker sock that I'm wearing over that. So now my inner liner is nice and dry. Yes, there may be some moisture on the outer sock, uh, but not on the liner itself. And then I'll use a nice, thick, very warm winter boot when I'm out there. Now, for me, because I do a lot of winter photography, I'm out in the winter quite a bit. I have a nice pair of winter boots that are, you know, a little pricey. They're not insanely pricey, but, you know, they're, they're a little pricey. For a lot of folks who um, may go out and only once in a while out in the winter for a, you know, a, a long expedition, that may not be cost effective. So one thing that you can think about, think about, I'm going to bring this up here, a picture of this. Hold on a second. Let me switch my screens. Um, this is called a Neos Overshoe. Um, and this company is called Neos. And what is an overshoe? Well, it's exactly that. It's kind of like a boot that's made out of Gore-Tex that you put over your regular boot. Um, and I have, I have one here that I can show you. Uh -um. So what happens is, is that, you know, these are kind of big. You can see how big these are. Um, certainly my feet are not this big, but they're made big so that I can wear a regular hiking boot, for example, and put it inside of this. And then this is what I'm wearing out when it's cold. And even though it's thin, um, and I recommend the thin ones, not the ones that are big insulated ones, it works remarkably well because where you lose a lot of your heat is through the sole of your feet. So this is adding another layer, another sole to your feet. So now that cold has to go through two layers to get to your feet. Plus, because it's Gore-Tex, the outside of it is, uh, it keeps your feet dry. So there's no water going in. And as a bonus, the cool thing about these things is that they're dry, they're waterproof, so you can actually walk in water. Um, you can get up to your ankle a little bit higher and get those shots down low in the water that you would not be able to get to otherwise. If your feet get really, really cold like mine do, I have a pair of electric socks <laughs> that I wear because I'm a wuss. <laughs> um, so what else do we have for gear, for uh, clothing? Yeah, so the wind is another big factor yes. in the wintertime. And so I always wear, have a windproof outer shell that goes over the top of everything. Mm -hmm. And that can be such a huge factor in how warm you end up staying. The same goes with my pants. You don't want to just wear regular pants in the wintertime and definitely don't ever wear jeans. Those are the worst possible yeah. winter clothing that known to mankind. Um, I like to have also a windproof type pant or a waterproof type pant, because again, if you, if that wind is coming in, you're going to feel so much colder. Yeah. And, you know, do, and you like to wear, I mean, like I do a kind of a base layer, right? You wear, yes. you know, again, I wear a merino wool base layer, kind of a very, actually I get the heavyweight, the thick merino wool, both, you know, bottoms and tops base layer. And then I have over that, um, almost like a ski pant and you certainly ski pant works you know you can get ski pants that are lined or some that are not lined depending on the temperature um, so again the layer system works really well for me I you know I don't have to have as many layers on my bottoms that I do on my top so usually yep. with the nice thick um, uh, merino wool um, uh, uh, base layer and then just that um, uh, 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 rainproof or waterproof pant of some kind, like a ski pant, you know, that's more than sufficient for me because that waterproofness works in two ways. Like you said, it it, uh, it um, uh, blocks the wind from getting to you, right? And also keeps you dry in case you end up sitting down or laying down in the snow to get those nice low shots. And another tip I'll just throw out there. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that really helps me stay warm is when I take my base layer and I tuck it into my pants or mm, maybe my yes. base layer and my next layer over the top of that, because a lot of heat escapes right through that seam. Mm -hmm. And so if you can kind of seal that off or if you wear like a ski bib that kind of comes up a little bit higher, it will really keep you a lot warmer. You know, the last thing I think we should talk about, you know, for now that we're talking about you know feet is also... Um, you know, grip, because that's usually a problem, can be a problem when you're out in this, in the ice and snow, right? 
It's kind mm-hmm. of slippery and you can, you, you can fall in. So why don't you tell us about the, what you like to use? So what I like to use are micro spikes. And these are cheap, you know, 20, 30 bucks on like Amazon. Basically, they just go on the bottom of your boot. And you can see here they have actual spikes on the bottom, but they're not such big spikes like what crampons would have that it makes it hard to walk in. So you can walk pretty normally in these things as long as you're not walking on like rocks or pavement or something like that. And so these will offer the, the, the best traction you can get for like real severe ice and slippery snow and things like that. But if you are walking on a more polished surface, then these may not be the best solution. And Juan's going to show you what he likes to use uh, in lieu of micro spikes. Well, you know, th- those micro spikes are great. I, I mean, I have a pair of those and I've used them many times. When you're in a situation where you're, you know, you're walking on a glacier, for example, or when you're walking on uh, an ice cave in Iceland, you know, those are super, super important because they're, they're not going to keep you upright. Right. Um, so but the challenge is when you're in a situation where you're walking on some ice and then you may walk, be walking on a on concrete of, or, or a wooden floor or something like that. Those can actually be dangerous because those things can actually be slippery on a concrete floor. So there is another solution, something else that you can use. Um, let me bring that up. And that is yak tracks. And yak tracks, you can see here, they're kind of a little bit simpler than uh, what, um, and certainly a lot cheaper than what uh, David showed. And these allow you to kind of mix, you know, gives you grip in both mixed surfaces when you're walking on icy surfaces or when you're walking on concrete, because there's a lot of rubber that's also exposed, not just this wire that's there. This certainly does not give you the same level of grip. As the yak track does, uh, as the uh, micro spikes do. So just keep that in mind. I think that it depends on the situation, depending on where you're going to be, you're going to use one or the other. Yep. So let's move on to gear that we like to use. Let's start with tripods. You will find that shooting in the winter, you're going to need a much heavier duty tripod than you would in other seasons. A couple of reasons for that. The weather tends to be windier. Uh, it's colder out, you're going to be trying to put it down into snow or trying to jam it into ice or whatever it may be. And so you need a, a much heavier duty tripod to be able to withstand those kind of conditions. One of the best things you can do is get a tripod that has some sort of like neoprene cover over mm. the carbon fiber leg. So that way, when you go to pick it up, you're not putting your gloved hand directly onto that carbon fiber that carbon fiber is so cold. And it doesn't matter how thick your glove is, it's gonna zap the heat right out of your hand. And if your tripod does not come with any kind of cover like that, you can just go to the hardware store, put some pipe insulation on there, and then wrap the pipe insulation with hockey tape and make your own at home uh, leg cover for your tripod. Um, I like tripods that allow me to kind of switch out the feet that I have on them. Uh, Sometimes it's nice to be able to have like a spike on the bottom of your foot, especially if you're shooting in ice and snow and things like that. Uh, Some people for shooting in deep snow, they'll even get like little snowshoe things that they can put on the bottom of their tripod legs. Uh, Shooting in really soft, uh, yeah, like uh, shown here on the screen. Uh, One of the most difficult things in the winter is shooting in really soft, powdery snow, especially if that snow is kind of deep. It's so hard to get a firm base. Your tripod always wants to move around or kind of settle in or sink. And even if you're out there just jamming it in, it may never actually get real stable. Um, And one, you've actually seen people like break their tripods, pushing it into the snow so hard. Yeah. So so what happens is, especially if you're in soft snow, right? So um, people open up the tripods, extend the legs out, you know, um, you know, open them up of what is possible and then jam them into the snow. And what they notice is that they jam it into the snow and the tripod kind of bobs right back up again. And that's because as it's going into the snow, the legs are being pushed apart. And I have seen people push those tripods hard down and actually crack their their carbon fiber legs. Because carbon fiber is exceedingly strong in one direction. So the carbon fiber legs are very strong in a vertical direction. But, you know, if you try to bend them, they are actually nowhere near as strong as they are in the in the vertical direction. So you're going to be careful. So the trick that I tell people to do 
is that if you're putting your tripod down in the snow, because I don't really like using those, those snow feet, or you know, some people will put uh, tennis balls on the bottom of their of their tripods. I don't really like to use that because I don't like the tripod floating on top of the snow. I want it to be firmly down in the snow, like, like David said. But I collapse the legs down, you know, maybe halfway or a third of the way in, not completely splayed out. And then as I put that tripod down, the snow splays the legs out, and then the tripod is nice and firm. So that's sort of my trick to make sure that your tripod is nice and sturdy, even on um, on really soft, you know, fluffy snow, because that's usually kind of the worst to be shooting in, because yeah. <laughs> it doesn't offer that much stability, right? No, it offers almost none. And so yeah, that's a really great tip there. The other challenge that I faced with using tripods in the cold is that, especially with certain manufacturers, some, I guess they use some kind of lubricant or something that oh, gets yeah. really stiff in the cold. Mm -hmm. So sometimes those leg locks can be really hard to loosen or to tighten effectively. And so, you know, I've found that some brands are much more resilient to the cold than others. So it pays to do some research along that front if you know you're going to be using your tripod in cold weather. And you uh, know, it depends I, on the grease that they use, right? Because you can get yeah. grease that is um, more tolerant of cold temperatures. Absolutely. And the last thing I'll t say about tripods is that if you get any wetness on your legs, like whether that be snow, ice, or actual water, uh, it's super important that you make sure that that's totally cleaned off before you collapse it back in. Otherwise, if your tripod is still cold, it's going to be completely iced up. You're not going to be able to get that leg back out when you need to extend it again. <laughs> and I've yeah. had that happen. I've had to shoot everything kneeling down because I haven't been able to extend my legs again. So don't let that happen to you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so another piece um, of gear that I think it's, it's useful when you're out there, because oftentimes in the snow, we are dealing with uh, snowy conditions, right? And being able to... Uh, cover your equipment, you know, can be useful. So, for example, um, one of the things that I like to use is a rain cover on my camera equipment. These are two rain covers. The one on the on the right is from Lenscoat. The one on the left from Think Tank. Really good rain covers for the cameras. But these are kind of big and bulky. Um, so I much prefer to use uh, one that is called the Think Tank Emergency Rain Cover. You can see how small it packs actually. It, it packs even smaller. You can see how little this packs down. Um, and it's a pretty simple rain cover that you can use when you're out there shooting in the, in the snow to keep the snow off of your gear so that, you know, when you get back in the vehicle, you can just take the cover off, shake it, and your camera's nice and clean. So it's just another little thing to take out with you that can make, you know, the experience a little bit better. Um, Absolutely. But in the case that you didn't do that, or, you know, it started snowing while you were a mile away from the vehicle, away from your bag, you didn't have it with you. The other thing that I find, you know, essential to have with me is a microfiber cloth um, in the vehicle. So that, you know, as you get back into a vehicle, but get back into our warm area, um, you know, in the snow that fell on your gear starts melting, you want to be able to dry that off. Because again, like, like David said, you don't want that that liquid, that water, on your gear, on the inside, you know, and then it fills in all the little cracks, and then you go outside and it freezes, and all of a sudden you can't turn your your zoom lens or your focus ring on your lens, or worse. So it's important to kind of dry it out, and a little, you know, just a simple you know, microfiber cloth is all that you need in the vehicle to keep things nice and dry. Yeah, one of the things I find that's really easy to forget in the winter is to bring sunglasses and sunscreen. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yep. wintertime is actually when you're most likely to get a sunburn because that snow on a bright sunny day, it reflects so much light back up onto you. And you need, really need to protect your skin from that UV damage. And the same goes with sunglasses. You know, if you don't have your sunglasses and it's a bright sunny day, well, it does a lot of damage to your eyes and you can actually get snow blindness. You know, I made that mistake the first time I summited Mount Rainier. You know, we left our tent at 2 a.m. And at 2 a.m., you don't think to bring sunglasses because it's dark outside. <laughs> and, you know, once that sun came up, oh, man, I was hurting all the way down. So not a pleasant experience. Make sure you bring those along. I can't imagine. I can't, that must have hurt. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. Um, I was squinting as much as I could. <laughs> 
Um, you know, something else that comes up all the time, right? And you get this all the question all the time. I get this question all the time, you know, for as, as we get ready for the winter in Yellowstone workshop, you know, I call all the clients and make sure that we answer any questions that they have, make sure that they have the right gear and all that kind of good stuff. And the question that almost always comes up is, you know, do I have to deal with fogging of my equipment, right? And, the, you know, the answer is depending on where you're going. In Yellowstone, you don't have to worry about it so much because the environment outside is really, really dry. Um, when you have to worry about it is when you're coming in from the outside, inside, um, into a warm environment of a hotel room or a restaurant or, or something like that. You know, usually in a place like Yellowstone is not a big deal when you a big deal when you go inside because it's still the relative humidity is still very low inside. But in some places it may not be. The relative humidity inside may be very high because they have humidifiers going on or or for whatever other reason. In that situation, when your lens is going from an area that's cold with relatively low humidity to an area that's warm with high humidity, or it could be cold high humidity. So really the key is the high humidity. Your lens can get fogged up. And one of the ways to prevent that, or the best way to prevent that, in my opinion, and I think David agrees with me, is keep your camera equipment inside your camera bag and let it acclimate to the area that you're going into, that you know that it's going to be higher humidity. Let it acclimate, let the temperature balance, you know, come into balance with the other location. And then that will prevent that fogging um, and that condensation that may happen on your lenses or on your camera gear or anything like that. So the idea is to acclimate the camera slowly. And by keeping it in the camera bag sealed up, that allows equipment to um, acclimate a lot a lot slower. Um, but, you know, so you've run into another issue, right, where people uh, may get some ice or fogging on the lenses. What do you do then? Oh, that's the worst. And so... Whenever I'm around my camera when it's cold out, I'm super careful about where I breathe. You know, if I'm going to go to the front of the camera and take, change a filter or or just see if there's maybe some snow or something that's been hitting the front of it, I'm always holding my breath. Because if any of your breath escapes and gets on that lens, it's going to fog it up, cause condensation, that'll ice up. And once that ice is up, you can't go rub it with a microfiber cloth or else it's going to scratch your optics. And that's the last thing you want to have happen. The same thing holds true on the back of your camera screen. You know, when you're going up there to shoot, you know, if you're breathing right on your viewfinder, well, you could create a block of ice right over that viewfinder. <laughs> now you're not going to be able to see through it. Yeah. And it's very common for like the back screen of my camera to get completely iced over when it's really cold. And I can only shoot through the viewfinder. So one thing that's a good tip for you to learn is don't become so dependent on that touch screen on the back of your camera, because in the wintertime, you may not be able to use that. Right. And you may have to be able to rely on being able to change things through the viewfinder. That includes things like autofocus points and so forth. Because once that camera turns to a block of ice and you're not going back to a warm environment for a while, well, it's going to stay in that condition until it does warm back up. Well, you know, it's funny. Uh, the other thing I would recommend, and I see this all the time with my clients, is that they have so much trouble operating their camera with gloves on. I, it's well worth just spending a few minutes at home and get used to trying to operate your camera with those gloves on. You'll find that you can do it. Uh, it just takes a little bit of practice. But the place you don't want to be practicing is when it's 10 below zero and you're outside fumbling <laughs> around trying to make the camera work. Right. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the thing is, one thing to keep in mind, too, you talked about, you know, with, when it's super cold and the, you may not be able to use the, the touchscreen on the back, you may not be able to use, if it's cold enough, you may not be able to use the screen on the back at all because the screen, you know, the screen on the back, see, this, this stuff is called liquid crystal displays, LCDs, and there's a liquid in there. And if it's cold enough, that liquid freezes and your LCD stops working. Don't worry, it's only temporary. Once it warms up, it'll start working again. What you'll see is will happen when it gets cold enough um, like it was in this year when I was in the in, in Yellowstone at minus 36, my camera completely froze off. And this is before mirrorless. The, the screen on the back of my DSLR completely froze and wasn't working. What happens initially is that, you know, you're, the, you start noticing that the screen kind of refreshes very slowly. It looks like it's in slow motion. 
And over time, you know, over a few minutes, it'll just completely stop working altogether. Um, so something else to keep in mind, you know, if you want to prevent that, if it's really cold out, you know, if you can't, take your camera, put it inside your jacket to keep it nice and warm. Um, so something like that doesn't happen. Together with your batteries, right? You want to keep those batteries, if you know, extra batteries, inside your jacket pocket. Because if those batteries get cold, your camera may say, you know, all of a sudden that it's out of juice. Um, but, you know, it's just because the battery is super cold. And what you can do is you can take that battery out, put take one out that you had under your jacket, put it in, and then you can shoot again, and then put the other camera or the other battery that was cold in your jacket. And once it warms up, you'll notice that it still has some juice left in it. Yeah, battery management is super important in the cold. <laughs> you know, I made that mistake, you know, a couple months ago with my drone. You know, I had one battery that I kept warm and I had another battery that was kind of sitting out in the cold. And I flew the first battery, then I went and I put the second battery in and it took off and said the charge was full, flew for about two or three <laughs> minutes and all of a sudden the battery went to 0%. Oh. And it's like emergency landing and it's like going landing right in the water. Oh. And I barely had time to get it away from the water and crash landed in a bush. Holy uh, moly. And so that's really scary. So it's super important that you keep those batteries warm so that they don't just discharge on you in the middle of an important shoot or when you're flying a drone. Because that, I mean, they, just what you mentioned is exactly what happens. A camera, a battery, they say it's full. And then in like 30 seconds flat, it'll go to zero. Um, oh, yeah. When it's that cold. <laughs> so... <clears throat> important to keep those those batteries nice and warm yeah so anything else Another, before we go into techniques uh the last thing i would mention is one of the biggest things that helped me with wintertime photography is to have two camera bodies yes because i want to avoid changing lenses when in these super cold conditions not only do you have like wind and snow and other things going on but if you you know if it's a real kind of humid type cold you also run the risk when you take that lens off that you could create condensation in ice on your sensor. And that's the last thing that you want to have happen. And so I try to avoid changing lenses at all costs. And the best way to do that is just to have two camera bodies and you're going to switch between the two cameras. Right. You know, and, and I did want to mention one last thing before we move on to techniques, because you, you know, you kind of talked about it when you're, um, using your camera, you're looking at your lens, whatnot, you don't want to be breathing, right? And the other thing I have seen, and then when people do do that and they get ice on the front of the lens or something like that, the next thing I see a lot of people do is breathe on it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, Which no, makes no, it no. even worse, so don't do that. <laughs> Resist the temptation to breathe on your lenses, even if you think, you know, it may be that you could do that and you could melt the ice that was there and just have water and then wipe it off, but I still wouldn't recommend doing that. I mean, just, you know, wait till you get it in the vehicle when you're in a nice, nice warm environment, use your um, fiber, uh, microfiber cloth to dry it out and then clean it. Uh, you know, appropriately. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, it's one of those things that, you know, if you haven't been out there shooting, you know, it's a mistake that it's kind of like natural. You know, oh, I'm going to blow on it and that will get the ice off. Yeah, don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> no, you can do that when it's close to freezing. But, right. you know, when you start getting 10 degrees below freezing yeah, well, and yeah. beyond, then, yeah, there's no way your breath can be used to clean your lens and all that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, and it uh, does happen from time to time. We talked about uh, the fogging. You know, when you're in a vehicle, because a vehicle is a, is a, a small enclosed space, when you're going from an outside, um, cold, dry environment, you get into a vehicle that is warm and there's been a bunch of people in it breathing, you can get some condensation. So usually it's good to keep, you know, um, the windows open, so the doors open for a little bit to dissipate that, that uh, high humidity. And then when you get in the vehicle and the heat from the vehicle is a dry heat. So that won't cause any condensation. The condensation will happen when there's people in the vehicle breathing a lot and that condensation is getting trapped inside the vehicle. Yep. Okay, so let's talk about technique. Is this is, you know, it, you know, it's super, super important. And I, you know, kind of feel a little guilty for leaving this as the last part of the of this session, but I think that the technique for shooting in cold uh, conditions and winter conditions is super, super important because it can be a little tricky. Um, 
You know, and the first one that I would recommend is to pay attention to your white balance. Um, and you can use whatever white balance, you know, uh, mode you like to use the most. I, there's not a problem with that. I like to use auto white balance because it's one less thing to think about when I'm at the field. Some people really like to use their, leave theirs on cloudy so everything is a little warmer. You know, but my advice is to when you get home or when you import your images and you start working on your images, the very first thing you should be doing is checking that white balance and adjusting the white balance appropriately. Um, you know, the snow tends to be a lot colder light, you know, the reflecting of the snow off uh, the light, the reflecting of the light off the snow tends to be bluish. So you may have to do stone compensation to remove a lot of that blue cast. You don't necessarily want to remove all, remove it all because you want that feeling of winter, of snow, or cold. But you also don't want your images to be super, super blue. So one thing to do is no matter what setting you use, make sure the first thing you do is when you start editing is correct that white balance. Um, and again, you know, you can't just change that and apply it to all the images. You will have to do that you know, kind of a, at least on a grouping by grouping basis because the light changes, you know, quite often. And if you have all this reflected light from different areas, um, you're going to have to contend with that. So, and that's going to make the difference between a great image and an amazing image, right? It is making sure that the colors are right in your scene. Mm -mm. So the other one is exposure compensation, right? You know, um, so, so David, you know, the... the for the longest time, I, I shot for film for many, many years. And you know, in the film days when I was shooting slides, you know, they say, well, you're shooting in snow. You're going to be compensating by a stop and a third or a stop and a half or something like that. So, you know, how do you deal with exposing for, for the snow, for that compensation of the snow? Well, with the, today's modern cameras, I find that they generally have such good dynamic range that you know, getting the perfect exposure isn't as important as it used right. to be, especially back when you were shooting the film. Yeah, especially slide uh, and, film, yeah. Yeah, and so as long as my histogram shows that, you know, I'm well-balanced, you know, I'm not close to blowing out highlights, I'm not close to clipping any of my shadows, then I'm usually pretty happy with it. You know, if I have a scene that has a ton of snow and it's pretty bright, then usually I will kind of overexpose just a little bit. Uh, there are some special cases, though. One is like, let's say we're shooting some wildlife and say we have a dark moose or a dark bison surrounded by a field of white snow. Well, the camera is going to base its baseline exposure on all that bright snow. It's not going to base it necessarily on the bison unless you're using some sort of spot metering. And so in that case, yeah, you'd probably have to overexpose quite a bit more than you would otherwise have to, to ensure that your bison is not a black blob. Right. I mean, to me, the important thing is, and the way I think about this, because it's going to change depending on how close, for example, you are or how much of that bison is taking up the screen real estate or, you know, your, your scene that you're trying to photograph. Um, so, for example, if your bison is a quarter of the scene, meaning three quarters of the scene is snow and the bison is a quarter of the scene, well, guess what? The camera's going to look at all that snow and it's going to take that exposure compensation and push it down. So now your bison is going to look like a blob, right? Mm -hmm. The reverse is also true, is that if you have a scene where the bison is 75% of your scene, black, dark animal, and the snow is only 25% of the scene, well, the camera is going to shoot that exposure way up, and then your snow is going to be completely blown out um, because the camera is looking at all that dark that dark fur and saying, well, I need to put more exposure in so for you, for you to be able to see all the detail in that fur. So you have to understand that how the camera is going to fail in those kind of situations and compensate, you know, appropriately. The great thing is now with um, uh, mirrorless cameras, we can see this in the viewfinder, right? We can see it both in the exposure and the viewfinder. If we have the zebras on, we can see the areas that may be overexposed very easily. Um, or better yet, you can look at the histogram as it appears on your viewfinder and make the adjustments before you trip that shutter. Um, because it's really tricky. You know, the, one of the trickiest exposures to do is when you have an animal that has pure white and pure, you know, and really dark, like an eagle, for example. Um, or a bison in the snow, or it could be even a coyote in the snow. Coyote is not as bad because the coyote is much lighter colored, but let's say a dark wolf would be the same thing, um, or an otter, 
would be very similar to that, very dark compared to the white. So very important to keep that, uh, keep that in mind. And in the winter time, the less adjustments you can do on the camera, the easier your life is going to be. You know, when you're when it's 20 below zero and you have your thick gloves on, that's not the time to be fiddling <laughs> through your menu. You know, that's why I like these cameras that allow you to create custom menus where you can put things that you like to use all the time in an easily accessible place. The other thing that will really pay dividends is to cre create some of your custom modes on your camera. And those are called like custom one, custom two, whatever it may be. That way you can just quickly switch between modes without having to change a whole host of other settings. Like if you're switching between a wildlife shooting mode and a landscape shooting mode, for example. I mean, I think it's, that, I mean, that's a great point because, you know, when we're out shooting in winter, we're dealing with extremes in a lot of cases, right? We're dealing with extreme light and extreme dark areas in a lot of cases or the large contrast, the large dynamic range that we're shooting. Luckily for us, you know, cameras nowadays have such an expanded dynamic range that it's a lot more forgiving, which means that I can turn over more of the exposure calculations, if you will, to the camera and just keep an eye on it. So, and I take full advantage of that. I take full advantage of how good these cameras are in evaluating a scene. You know, I need to understand how, when they're going to fail and how they're going to fail to compensate for it, like we talked about a minute ago. But as much as I can let the camera handle, I, the happier I am. So typically I'm shooting what, in auto ISO um, and I'm shooting in aperture priority and I'm dealing with exposure compensation. Um, yep. You know, and even for wildlife, for me, that works for wildlife because I keep, you know, shoot for wildlife, I'm shooting at a distance with a long lens and I'm shooting wide open apertures, you know, F4, F5, 6. So by having my camera on aperture priority, I leave my camera at F5, 6, F4, you know, the camera's going to give me the fastest shutter speed that it can within the ISO range, which is usually what I want for wildlife. I don't have to set my uh, uh my shutter speed and hope that you know the camera can open up you know can can correct a, uh, create a correct exposure based on the available light because maybe it just can't you know it needs f 2.8 but it can't get to f 2.8 um yeah so that's why the auto iso is important modern cameras nowadays also know the focal length that you're using and they will use the one over rule to help you achieve the correct exposure for that particular scene. So it'll give you, you know, it'll, it'll, in other words, it will increase, if you have an auto ISO, it'll increase your ISO to give you a fast shutter speed um, to be able to handle and hold that long lens that you're using. Um, so yeah, so keeping, you know, taking advantage as much as you can of what the camera is able to, how the camera is able to help you, it's gonna help a lot when you're trying to fumble with those little buttons on the back of the camera with these big thick gloves which is almost impossible. Yep. Um, and the one last thing I will say, especially with like landscape shooting, is that if you're in doubt, just bracket. Yes. And you don't have to keep all those bracketed shots, but at least you know, especially if the light is changing quickly, that at least one shot in that bracket is going to have the proper exposure, or you can combine multiple shots if you have a very large dynamic range, which sometimes does happen in the winter when you have really bright light hitting the snow, that can easily blow yeah. out. And then you may have darker features that could easily become clipped. Right. right. And as you know, I mean, once you, once you blow out that snow, I mean, you're done. You know, when yeah. you have no texture in that snow, it, it just, it's just a big white blob. So it's no, it's no good. One, one last thing that we should mention is, you know, the, the brightness of our, of our rear screens, right? Um, oftentimes when we're out there in a situation like this, where in the winter, where it's really, really bright, you want to, boost up that brightness in the back of your camera so that you can actually see that screen a lot better. When we're shooting mirrorless, it's a little easier because we're looking through the viewfinder and that's what I, you know, rely on the most as opposed to the rear screen. But, you know, make sure that you turn that up to be able to see it as much as possible on the, under those conditions. <clears throat> so, you know, one thing that I think we should talk about, we should touch upon is, you know, kind of techniques for creating... Um, you know, different looks in the snow. One of my favorite ways to, uh, or favorite images to create are those where you get these nice, beautiful streaks of snow. Um, and you got to do this, you know, it doesn't always work. Um, let me give a quick example here of what I mean by that. Let me switch over here. 
This is a uh, red fox in the snow, and it was snowing very, very hard. And in order to create something like this, um, where you have all that snow, that feeling of you know super coldness and super harshness of the environment, which it was, um, the technique to, in order to do this is going to be um, for us to use a slow shutter speed. Now, that seems kind of backwards, right? Um, using a slow shutter speed when we're shooting wildlife in handheld can be challenging. And it is. In a situation like this, for example, I had to shoot a bunch of different images. And most of them were no good because my fox was too blurry. There wasn't any sharp elements to my fox. Um, but you know what the trick for me was to make a lot of different images and one of them hopefully was going to work in a situation like this because obviously the fox is moving and i'm shooting in a situation like this i'm shooting at you know almost a quarter of a second you know to be able to capture that snow streaking um, like this and give you that sense of motion that sense of environment that sense of coldness um, in the air so this is a tricky image to make but if you're able to do it it can actually become very effective. You know, the, the opposite to that is an image like we saw earlier. This is a high shutter speed, which actually freezes that, um, uh, that snow in the air and gives you the pinpoint snow. And, you know, that's a totally different look. In a situation like this, because these animals are not moving as fast, and you don't expect, by, even though bison can run very fast, here they're not really running. Um, so the effect of slow-moving snow is not as uh, effective. Also, the type of snow is going to play a crucial role here in that this, if you pay attention to these snowflakes, they're really small, meaning it was actually much colder. So the snow is um, you know, very small clumps of snow versus when you look at, for example, the fox, these are much larger clumps that are falling down a lot slower. So I'm able to create those nice long streaks. And here's another example of a situation where, um, you know, it wasn't snowing all that much. And, you know, I want to be able to capture that snow. In a situation like this, if I had done a slow shutter speed, the snow would have practically disappeared. So this is in a situation where you want to have a fast shutter speed in order to capture as much of that snow that's falling from the sky. Well, folks, thank you so much for tuning in to our video on winter photography, gear, and techniques. We hope you found this information useful. And if you did, please give us a thumbs up, leave a comment below. If you have any questions, jump on our Facebook group, Images in Focus. We'd love to engage in discussion with you if you have any questions about any of the things that we covered. And please share this video with your friends, as I'm sure many other people can also find this content useful. Again, thank you for your support. And until next time. Thank you, guys. Take care.